Hi. Uh, this video lecture, we're going to be looking at um, Guy Debord's Society of the Spectacle. Very uh, influential book um, to this day that basically takes some of the things that Marx was writing about in Capital, um, about capitalism and about commodity fetishism and and also some of Marx's earlier writings about alienation and applies them to questions about the media and consumer culture that you know, were really important you know, 100 years uh, after Capital was written when Guy Debord wrote The Society of the Spectacle in 1967. So these questions about the media and consumer culture and their relationship to alienation and commodity fetishism were really pressing for um, people all over the world at that point. And basically Debord tried to address them through this uh, totalizing concept that he calls the spectacle. So he basically is kind of trying to expand uh, on some of these ideas that Marx had initially presented. Uh, and in the 1960s, this became a very a hugely influential text uh, for a lot of young radicals and, and especially like the students and workers who you know, nearly toppled the French government in May of 1968 uh, in an uprising in, in France. And uh, to this day, the Society of the Spectacle continues to be a very influential text for uh, anti-capitalist activists and intellectuals and, and artists uh, and people around the world today. Um, the first thing you might notice in, in picking this up is the, the style in which it's written, uh, written much more as this kind of manifesto rather than, you know, like a sort of an intellectual rhetorical argument. Um, it's, you know, divided up into these little aphorisms uh, that, you know, might be as short as one sentence. Uh, it might be as long as, you know, two or three pages. And it's written in this very, you know, sort of biting uh, prose um, that is, you know, trying to kind of mix, uh, I would say, you know, intellectual criticism with, with poetry. Um, and, you know, it's a very unique text. You know, if you look through it, there are, you know, like little film reels throughout the text and, and Du Bord, um, you know, years later actually made the Society of the Spectacle into a film uh, which basically like, you know, narrates uh, the text over like clips from different films and, and movies. Um, this kind of like mashup that uh, was created in a style of uh, what we'll later talk about is de to uh, this, uh, this kind of subversive practice that of uh, cutting up and rearranging um, media and, and images. So um, Debord, uh, you know, here as we see pictured on the left, was a founding member of this group called the Situationist International. Um, before that, they were they had been uh, a group called the Letterist International, but they were, this was basically a, a group of of revolutionary artists and intellectuals, mostly based in France. The international part might be a bit of an exaggeration uh, as far as the scope of this group, because it was a pretty small kind of avant-garde kind of group. Um, you know, it was not like a sort of an international working class you know, proletarian movement so much as like a, a loosely affiliated um, cohort of artists and intellectuals and um, urban radicals and, and people like that. Uh, so founded in, in 1957, the Situationists had basically kind of carried on the legacy of avant-garde movements like Dada and, and Surrealism. Uh, 
uh, in, in a way that had tried to kind of link their criticism of, of art and, you know, kind of the, the establishment art world and uh, the dominant culture um, with a, an analysis of capitalism that was informed by, above all, by Marxist theory. They were not the, the first to have done this. Uh, you know, this had been done in, in going back to the 1930s in the surrealist movement with um, intellectuals like Andre Breton, uh, who had basically, you know, tried to kind of mix avant-garde uh, aesthetics with Marxist theory. Um, and, you know, in, and in doing so to kind of bring a kind of a radical politics into the avant-garde art world. Um, it's very, it's very French <laughs> kind of, it's the kind of thing that like, you know, uh, people in, in many parts of the world uh, have, have done or, or attempted um, but it seems like that the French seem to do it the best. <laughs> um, so the, the text, the Society of the Spectacle begins with basically an allusion to the first sentence of Marx's Capital, um, which had talked about, you know, an immense accumulation of, of commodities. So Marx had begun Capital with this, this sentence, the wealth of societies in which the capitalist mode of production prevails presents itself as an immense accumulation of commodities. And, you know, so Debord kind of tweaked this um, and substituted the word spectacle for commodity in the sense that then, you know, starts right off the bat by to suggest that, you know, the, a spectacle is, is a kind of commodity um, or perhaps a uh, like a higher stage or a deeper stage of the commodification of social life. Um, but it's a, a particular kind of commodity. And just as Marx had said that, you know, the commodity is the elementary form of a capitalist society, De Bord is saying, you know, the, the spectacle has become this, this elementary form, like the, like the atom uh, of this society that is, you know, sort of an extension of what Marx had been writing about a hundred years ago. So, you know, again, like remember this, this sort of context when thinking about the text um, to think about how it is that, that De Bord is kind of referencing Marx and capital and also saying that, you know, we need to kind of like extend the thesis um, because uh, the commodity society has extended and developed and in some cases worsened. So he, De, uh, De Bord continues on in this, in this first thesis to say, you know, everything that was directly lived has moved away into representation. And this will be a, a sort of a recurring theme through the society of the spectacle. And basically he's, he's suggesting that, that images and appearances that, that, you know, representations have become substitutes for like, you know, real living um, in the society of the spectacle, uh, the relationship between representation and reality has been turned on its head, it has been inverted. Um, and so, you know, nothing says that more than a bunch of people standing around together, all looking at their screens individually. Um, the way in which like direct living has become, has moved away into a, a mode of representation. Thesis number four also um, paraphrases Marx's famous statement on commodity fetishism uh, from, from chapter one of Das Kapital, part, part four. Uh, here, De Bord just kind of tweaks it again, again substitutes, the, puts in the word images where Marx had spoken of, of things and so De Bord says the spectacle is not a collection of images, but a social relation among people mediated by images. 
so again, this is like the, the same kind of idea um, of, you know, from Marx, where Marx had described capitalism as a kind of an inverted world, a world turned upside down, where human beings and social life are dominated by things, dominated by things in, in the form of commodities. And Debord is saying we've like kind of reached now a, a, a new stage in which uh, human beings and social life are now dominated by images uh, in, the, in the form of spectacles, uh, spectacles that are, are very much commodities, but like a, a higher stage of the commodity, or perhaps a, a more invasive kind of commodity. The spectacle is then, as Debord describes it, the newest incarnation of the concrete inversion of life. Um, and he says the auton and the autonomous movement of the non-living. The autonomous movement of the non-living again recalls Marx's image, you know, of, of capitalism as this world where human beings come to be dominated by, you know, machinery and technology and things and, and commodities, you know, by what he called, you know, dead labor, like this bit like basically like the, the dead are controlling the living and, and us as, as human beings are in the service of these, um, of these systems that have, you know, seem to take on a life of their own and, and become objectified. So like the fetishism of the commodity, uh, the society of the spectacle describes a world which really is topsy-turvy it really is inverted or a world turned upside down and it doesn't just seem that way um, and in that sense it is a world where as he says in thesis number nine the true is a moment of the false this is an, an allusion to uh, the philosopher hegel's work the phenomenology of spirit um, basically like in a false situation in a in a in a false society the the true can seem to be uh true but only at a kind of surface level so it's like what marx had said about you know mainstream economics about bourgeois economists in his time for example that it wasn't so much that they were wrong it's that their ideas were true but true insofar as they were describing a larger, you know, kind of false process, a false moment, that they were true uh, in the sense that, you know, for uh, a world that had been turned, you know, upside down, uh, that this, their categories were true enough in that sense, but only because they failed to probe beneath that surface and to ask, you know, the more sort of like radical questions that Marx was asking. So like the accumulation of capital in the way that Marx had described, the spectacle becomes this like juggernaut of social domination that seems to grow beyond the control of human beings. It takes on this kind of Frankenstein kind of life of its own. And in the same way that Marx had described capitalism as like inherently globalizing, um, you know, as always trying to expand its, its reach, expand its markets, um, expand its, its coverage over the whole world. Du Bois is saying that the spectacle has this same kind of globalizing, totalizing logic uh, in a sense, as he describes in, in thesis number 13, that it covers the entire surface of the world and bathes endlessly in its glory. And the result of this is, is that visibility becomes conflated with value. So as, you know, the commodity is, uh, you know, is, contains this, this thing that we call value, the spectacle, contains this thing we call visibility. Uh, and so in this society of the spectacle, that which is appears is good, 
and that which is good appears. And I suppose you could say sort of the converse of this is, you know, that which is bad is basically made invisible and, and is not seen. Um, and, you know, that which is socially deemed, um, you know, unacceptable or marginal or um, just not up to par will be rendered uh, invisible in the spectacle. And so the, the society, the spectacle, in some ways becomes like kind of a, a struggle over, over visibility, over, over representation, um, over, you know, uh, groups of people, you know, struggling to have themselves seen. Speaking of <laughs> conflating visibility and value, um, it's just so much going on in this, uh, on this magazine cover. Um, easiest workout for an epic ass, uh, for example, or uh, fashion under $50, beauty under $10, decode his crazy mind tricks. Um, anyway, the, the, the idea here of like visibility being conflated with value um, really, you know, reminded me first and foremost of the, of the Kardashians and also this thing that DeBoer then describes, you know, in um, thesis number 17, where he talks about, you know, the, the kind of descent from being to having to then uh, appearing. So this again goes back to something Marx had talked about in, in his earlier writings in 1844 when he talked about the concept of alienation. And, and here Marx had talked about that, you know, under capitalism, basically our, our sense of being, like our, our, our existential, you know, kind of like ontology is, is reduced to a possessive state of, of having. So that we kind of like evaluate, you know, who we are or, you know, our, our sense of being based on what we have, what we own, you know, our, our material, possessions and that this is you know a kind of a, a, a kind of alienation under capitalism a, a, a kind of like a reduction of the human being you know from this you know state of being down to a state of having Marx puts it much more um, fiercely in saying you know private property has made us so stupid and narrow-minded that an object is ours only when we have it now, in the society of the spectacle, DeBoard is saying that we go into an even deeper state of alienation, um, where we go not only from having, but to a state of appearing, like just appearing to have. Um, and, you know, the Kardashians, again, are, are a great example of this in the sense that, you know, they are, you know, basically just like kind of famous for being famous like famous just because they are themselves like visible, um, but their visibility has tremendous value. Like every time they, you know, post something on social media or, um, you know, do or say anything has tremendous like economic repercussions. And so, you know, for DeBoard, I think like, you know, he's thankfully for his own sake died long before there were the Kardashians, um, but he, uh, I think, would have seen this kind of thing as like um, the ultimate example of this descent from being to having to appearing. And uh, just in the same way that, you know, he is kind of like looking back to um, Marx's writings on commodity fetishism and, and alienation, DeBoard is also making these comparisons between the spectacle and, and religion. Uh, so that's why I have this, you know, Jesus piece with the diamonds in the, in the place of the crown of thorns. Um, thesis number 20, he says, the spectacle is the material reconstruction of the religious illusion. 
And this again, you know, it, you know, again, recalls what Marx had said about religion. Uh, he had said that, you know, religion was basically, you know, religious illusions were basically projections of human powers and, uh, you know, collective social productions, which then take on this appearance of being objective or supernatural. You know, the, the, the like we kind of, we as human beings create uh, the gods that will then rule over us. Um, that there is this kind of process of like projection um, in which human beings come to be dominated by the very things that they have uh, created. And Debord is extending this saying that, you know, on one level, you know, like the spectacle is a secular commodity, but it mystifies things in the same ways that, you know, is, is comparable to religion. It has this kind of mystifying effect um, that Marx had, had talked about as, you know, the fetish character of commodities. How, you know, and again, remember when Marx talks about the fetish character of commodities, he means it in a kind of a religious sense of that, you know, commodities seem to take on these like theological, supernatural kind of qualities beyond their immediate tangible properties and their immediate use value. They take on this kind of extra thing. You know, a car becomes more than a car and a pair of shoes becomes more than a pair of shoes. They take on this, you know, in, the, in this kind of almost mystical kind of way. And so Debord is saying, you know, in, in it, with regard to the society of the spectacle, he says spectacular technology has not dispelled the religious clouds where men had placed their own powers detached from themselves. It only tied them to an earthly base. So, you know, these commodities may be kind of secular and, and capitalism, you know, might be uh, you know, this, this highly secularized system. But Debord is saying like, we're not, we're still really not that far, like kind of removed from the days of like religious illusions. It's just now we've kind of come to worship or be, you know, under the mystical spell of commodities in the way that we had once been under the mystical spell of gods. So the chapter here um, is titled Separation Perfected. Um, and you'll notice that throughout this chapter, Debord, you know, sort of periodically goes back to this word separation or, or talks about the absence of unity. And it, it's important to understand that this is something that's we're calling what Marx had said about alienation under capitalism, that, that alienation was a was a basically a kind of separation that people experienced uh, under capitalism so that, you know, at, at, at the first most immediate level, people are separated from the means of production, they are they are separated from the land uh, taken, you know, robbed of their tools, um, robbed of the things that had allowed them to um, reproduce their existence. And so now they have to like go get a job, you know? Um, so in so far as the people are separated from the means of production, this is a fundamental stage in the creation of a proletariat. Uh, and then in, you know, the process of wage labor, you know, workers are then cut off from their creative potential, you know, robbed, not just of the, um, the things that they produce, but also don't have any say in the way that, you know, in the process, the way that things are being produced, the labor process. Um, so people are kind of cut off from this, creative potential that Marx thinks is kind of inherent uh, 
to being a human being, you know, what he calls our species being. And we're also in that process kind of separated or, you know, divorced from one another, from, from our fellow human beings by this situation of, you know, individualized competition. Um, whereas, you know, Marx believes we are fundamentally like social beings um, the conditions of, of capitalism serve to separate us and, and alienate us um, from one another. Now, Debord basically believes that what the society, the spectacle does is it kind of represents a whole nother stage in this process of separation, um, that it's created a condition of generalized separation and what he calls the proletarianization of the world. So, you know, the idea that this condition of proletarianization of separation and, and alienation now runs deeper, um, that we are not just, you know, being robbed of uh, the means of production and our means of labor, but of the whole existence of social life, of, of, every, of everyday life. Um, he'll explain this a little bit more in the next couple of slides. In thesis 28, he, the board basically refers to, starts talking about the economy and, and technology as producing a condition of, of isolation. So here again, continuing with this theme of separation. And he's talking about like the isolating effects of like, you know, the automobile and, and televisions and, you know, these, these very 20th century kind of media technologies that were central to creating what he calls the society, the spectacle. Um, and so then, you know, in thesis 28, he refers to this book called The Lonely Crowd um, that is, I, I think to this day is still like the best selling book of sociology ever written. Uh, by a guy named David Reisman, who was a sociologist at, at Harvard for many a year, um, and a, a sort of team of other um, sociologists who, you know, assisted with the project. This was uh, something that turned out to be a very um, influential book, um, even beyond academia, you know, it, uh, something that, you know, was was popularly read and um, discussed because it really tapped into something that was going on in the 1950s, especially um, this title, The Lonely Crowd, you know, speaks so well to the idea that we have on the one hand, this kind of mass society, but of um, people who are all kind of individualized and cut off and isolated and, and separated and, and alienated from one another. Um, so uh, it's all kind of like individualized atoms. And Reisman's argument was that, you know, people actually in, in that condition, when they are uh, atomized like that, they don't become more kind of like individualistic, they actually become more conformist. They, they do more to kind of like try to fit in and and keep up with the Joneses and, and not stand out. And so Reisman's book was really, had a lot to say about this, you know, issue of conformity in America during the 1950s. And so it, you know, kind of took on a, um, a, a popular appeal to the point that, you know, Bob Dylan referenced it in one of his songs, as, as my little fun fact points out here. And, and uh, David Reisman was, you know, ended up on the cover of Time magazine. And um, especially with the, with the Dylan song, the, the idea of the lonely crowd really resonated with like the young counterculture who kind of like saw their parents um, lifestyles and, and their lifestyles of conformity, but also a, a real like loneliness and, and separation. And so, you know, the kids in the, in the counterculture were like, you know, that's, I don't want to grow up into that kind of like middle-class suburban, you know, kind of 
consumerist, you know, working at the office kind of lifestyle. So in, in the conclusion of the first chapter, um, De, De Bord is again, you know, reflecting on this condition of, of alienation in the society of the spectacle and, and saying that, you know, whereas Marx had, had talked about alienation um, only at, at the stage of, of labor, you know, of, of the work process of which, you know, workers were alienated from um, their labor and, and the process of, of doing the labor. De Bord is suggesting that alienation is something now that runs much deeper and is more all encompassing in people's lives, you know, so that it's not just our labor that's being commodified, but like our imagination, our, our dreams, our, our fantasies, um, you know, the, the, the total ask, uh, the total existence of humanity is now something he's saying that has been like, kind of like colonized and, and commodified. And so as a result, you know, alienation is something that is now much deeper, um, not just something that we experience at work. So in thesis number 30, he says, you know, the more he accepts recognizing himself in the dominant images of need, the less he understands his own existence and his own desires. We get this image again, it's a separation in which like we are like separated from our own like basic, like, you know, desires and existence um, because we've, you know, bought into like these uh, false needs perpetuated by the consumer culture. And then in three, thesis number 33 says, you know, the, the more his life is now his product, the more he is separated from his life. I guess in, in our day and age, maybe if you put the word brand in the place of product, that would describe a, a lot of people, you know, like the people that are through social media and, and, and other means, like basically always like kind of branding themselves. And so De Bord is saying that there is like just a fundamental process of separation and alienation that like even Marx couldn't have imagined in his time because uh, capitalism had not yet developed to the extent that it had colonized and commodified every aspect of human existence. So chapter two, um, he got, basically tries to kind of historicize this development of the spectacle. You know, he tries to like kind of say like, how did this come about historically? And in, in thesis number 42, he says the spectacle is the moment when the commodity has attained the total occupation of social life. Um, so again, we get this idea, like I keep thinking of like the image of like colonization. It's just like something where the, the commodity has colonized, not just our, our work time, but our leisure time. Um, and, you know, even like our, maybe our, our dreaming time. Re De Bord references um, the second industrial revolution, which takes place in, in, you know, the first couple of decades in the 20th century, um, it's associated with the assembly line and, and the mass production of consumer goods like, you know, automobiles and refrigerators and, you know, everything that kind of made sort of the consumer lifestyle, you know, possible. And he says at this point in history, this is when um, alienated consumption becomes for the masses a duty supplementary to alienated production. And that thesis made me think of this, this part in the movie Modern Times um, that's pictured here in the slide with Charlie Chaplin. Uh, and it's a very famous movie. If you've seen it, you know, it's like Charlie Chaplin is like working on the assembly line and uh, he can't keep up with the machinery. And, you know, that leads to all kinds of like comedic physical kind of, you know, scenarios with Charlie Chaplin. Uh, but then even when he goes to like take a break, 
um, from his work and his break time, time to eat, he gets um, uh, hooked up to this feeding machine here, you know, that, that then, you know, proceeds to go haywire and, you know, it's like trying to feed him this, this corn and, and the machine just starts going really, really fast. And, you know, it's all very funny, but it's also, you know, making this larger point that is consistent with what DeBoard is saying here about like the connection between like alienated production and alienated consumption, you know, that now like the, the commodification of our lives as human beings doesn't only happen when we're producing things, but also, you know, when we're basically being like force fed um, in this, uh, this same kind of assembly line kind of style, um, alienated consumption becomes, you know, this kind of complement, this, this supplement to alienated production. Now, of course, there's, you know, important differences that DeBoard, you know, kind of immediately points out, um, you know, whereas like, you know, as a worker, uh, you know, we are basically like alienated and just kind of told what to do. The consumer is, you know, more kind of like courted and, you know, manipulated and, and have all kinds of ways in which like, you know, the consumer culture tries to appeal to us with a different kind of logic. Um, but there is still this, this process of, of inversion of, of the world being turned upside down so that the humanism of the commodity takes charge of the workers' leisure and humanity, as it says here in thesis number 43. Like, do we get this image of things being flipped on the head so that the hu it's the humanism of the commodity that's in charge? Um, and in charge of the human being, the workers, leisure and humanity. Uh, from, in the next thesis, he invokes, you know, this famous thing that Marx had said um, that I'll come back to more towards the end of the uh, presentation. This thing that Marx had said that, you know, religion is the opium of the people, you know, basically compared um, religion to like, you know, a, a drug that, you know, sedates you and, and kills the pain. And it's DeBoer, you know, basically says like, is, you know, kind of saying like, it's the consumer culture, this, the spectacle that is like the new opium of the masses. He says the spectacle is a permanent opium war, which aims to make people identify with goods and good with goods with commodities and satisfaction with survival. So of course, like, you know, the opium war metaphor also, you know, refers to the way that like, you know, the British had forced, um, you know, the uh, opium onto the, the Chinese. Um, so it's, you know, kind of referencing a, a few different things here. Um, but one that, you know, makes people identify goods with commodities, basically like the good life is the, the material life. Um, you know, like the American dream is defined, you know, in this kind of materialistic terms in, in, in terms of commodities um, and satisfaction with survival. So, you know, the situationists, had uh, you know had this slogan, for example, that's in the uh, in the right corner of the slide here, which basically translates to um, "be reasonable, demand the impossible." Uh, so this was something that they counter um, posed to you know the reality of what they called survival sickness under capitalism. Board really tears into celebrities <laughs> in uh, the, uh, especially like thesis number 60 and 61. Um, his, as you can maybe imagine, you know, he, he saved some of his most uh, 
punishing comments for celebrities. He calls celebrities the spectacular representation of a living human being. <laughs> it's like casting some serious shade there to say like, well, they're not human beings. They're, they're a representation of a human being. They're like a spectacle of a human being, you know, like Tupac at Coachella or something, you know, like the, the, the celebrity like embodies, he says like everything that he has been saying about alienation and commodity fetishism and the way that, you know, representation has been substituted for reality. Um, you know, he says like being a star means specializing in the seemingly lived, the, the seemingly is doing a lot of work in that, you know, so it's like, they're like only appearing to live and, and you know, or, or, I don't know, you just get the sense of like, you know, what everybody kind of knows is, you know, that like celebrity lives are kind of fake. Um, and, you know, on social media, um, you know, Instagram in particular, that is a place where we definitely see the star as like, you know, seemingly, uh, seemingly lived entity. Um, so as an alienated representation of a real person, uh, the celebrity becomes a model for identification who, in his words, superficially represents different types of personalities uh, and must possess a complete stock of accepted human qualities. So here's this, this thing that, you know, we always see when we look at like the history of celebrity and like especially like celebrity magazines and like profiles in celebrity magazines is there's always this kind of thing of like, you know, celebrities are kind of like, you know, on the one hand, they're, they're, they're really glamorous and they live this, you know, lifestyle that, you know, we can only imagine. But on the other hand, they're just like us. And like they, they put on their pants, you know, one leg at a time. And like, there's all these, you know, the, these celebrity profiles will always have to kind of like, you know, um, walk this this tightrope, you know, strike this 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 fine balance between, you know, emphasizing the the glamour and the and the distance, you know, of the celebrity, almost like a you know, almost like an aristocrat or something. And then on the other hand, you know, their down hominess, you know, the the way that they um, are just like us. They're adoring. Uh, spectators. So um, in sort of like, I guess, ex expounding on that idea of celebrity um, in uh, thesis number 64 and 65, DeBoard introduces this um, distinction that he makes between a concentrated spectacle and a diffuse spectacle. And the, the concentrated spectacle is, is really the one, the, the concentrated part, I, I take it to mean that like the spectacle is basically concentrated in this one person, in this, in this leader, you know, um, in, uh, this, in, the, in the cult of personality. Um, and so, you know, some kind of a dictatorship and a dictatorship in which like you know, coercion and, and force are the main instruments of social control, um, you know, either coercion or the threat of coercion, the, the threat of violence. Um, DeBoer, as he says in, in Thesis 64, says whenever the concentrated spectacle rules, so does the police. So, you know, this kind of like police state authoritarianism. And this is usually what we think of when we think of like authoritarian societies when we think of like you know dictatorships uh is where and where the spectacle is basically concentrated onto the singular leader who is then you know put on a pedestal in this kind of almost godlike kind of fashion but the diffuse spectacle the board is is saying is, is something that's that's obviously different but in some ways it's um it's just kind of like social control by another means. Um, and it doesn't 
it all look like what we think of a, as an authoritarian dictatorship kind of society. Um, but it is in its own way, you know, totalizing and, um, you know, squashing of the individual at the same time that it purports to be a um, product of individual choice. So rather than simple state coercion, what the diffuse spectacle does is it rules by seeming to empower people, to empower consumers to make individual choices and consent. It doesn't say, you know, you must do this or else you go to prison. It's like, it, but, it's, but it is a, a, a kind of a manipulative sort of message. And it one that leaves us in this, you know, he describes it as this kind of like this cycle of dissatisfaction, you know, where the consumer society is, is always promising to satisfy the consumer, but really can only deliver these fleeting fragments of happiness, uh, as Debord calls them. It must leave us in a perpetual cycle of dissatisfaction because that uh, perpetual dissatisfaction is what is needed to fuel more consumption. Um, people who are satisfied with themselves and their lives generally don't make for good consumers. Um, what makes for good consumers are people that feel like they need something extra. They, they're missing something. They have some void. And then, you know, the commodity will, you know, come in and, and temporary, temporarily, you know, like give them that fix, but then leave them wanting more. That's the ultimate um, uh, ideal from the perspective of, you know, people who are trying to sell stuff. That's the ideal kind of consumer. So in, in, in his later writings, Debord, you know, kind of comes back to this diffuse and, and uh, concentrated spectacle distinction and says, well, you know, it's, it's maybe not as absolute as I had first made it out to be. Uh, he writes this book 20 years later called Comments on the Society of the Spectacle, uh, in which he's, he talks about a third kind of spectacle called an, an integrated spectacle, which, you know, I think of as being like very like Trumpian in the sense that it combines, you know, this kind of, uh, you know, cult of personality of the uh, political dictator with a kind of a, a diffuse consumption of uh, individuals all pursuing their own self-interests and their, uh, their, you know, choices. Now, at this point, you know, we may be asking like, <laughs> this spectacle is so totalizing. I mean, do we have to just like kill ourselves and give up or like, what do we do? Like, you know, how do we resist the spectacle? Um, how can it, you know, possibly be thought about as, as changing in some way? And um, one thing, Debord doesn't talk about it so much in this text, but um, he'd been a central part of this in, in other parts of it is uh, activity with the situationists was, you know, the situationists had developed this practice that they called the tournament. Uh, I'm sure I'm not pronouncing this word correctly because it's in French. So I'm going to try not to embarrass myself by continuing to say it, but it's basically like a French word that means like you know, to, to like reroute or, or to, to like a detour to like, you know, kind of like, or, or like a, a more aggressive word for it is like to hijack, to, to turn something around, um, to turn the spectacle against itself. Um, and so it's a, it's a kind of like a kind of a parody, you know, or a, a form of parody that, that takes a media image or an advertisement and, and modifies it in such a way as to convey a message that, that is antithetical to the original thing. So, you know, here in this slide, this is, you know, a relatively famous example of this, of um, somebody taking the, the uh, billboard for Marlboro cigarettes, 
you know, with the iconic Marlboro cowboy, you know, supposed to represent freedom and liberty and, you know, the American West and, you know, just a man on a horseback with nothing but him and his cigarettes and, and, and his horse. Um, <laughs> and, you know, it's sort of like, you know, modifies this into, uh, takes the Marlboro lettering and, and uh, rewrites it to say it's a boar. And this was always like the situationist kind of thing about consumer culture is, is that, you know, it promises uh, fun and excitement and, you know, everything will be new and improved. And the reality is, is it delivers, you know, nothing but boredom, uh, you know, same as it ever was. So the, these kinds of techniques of uh, determent um, had, uh, you know, have had like a, a lasting legacy. They, they were really just getting started in the 1950s. Uh, it had, you know, it is, is something that has uh, influenced as we'll look at in the next couple of slides, the, the punk movement and, and um, also these kind of anti-consumerist practices of that are known as culture jamming. We might as well go ahead and look at some of those examples. Uh, so, you know, Determinant, um, the, some of the people around the Sex Pistols, um, not necessarily like Johnny Rotten or Sid Vicious themselves, but the, the people around the Sex Pistols, like their manager, Malcolm McLaren, and, and their designer, this guy, Jamie Reed, were very much influenced by the Situationists. And, you know, sort of, tried to kind of appropriate, uh, you know, bring some of these ideas uh, into um, the way that they created the Sex Pistols as this kind of spectacle, um, you know, of the punk scene in, in 1976, 1977. And so, you know, the, the whole campaign around uh, God Save the Queen and, and um, you know, both promoting that song and like protesting the, the Queen's Jubilee of that year, uh, you know, it was both like a this really incredible moment where pop and politics came together. And so the, you know, this had a much bigger influence probably than the Situationists themselves ever had. Um, the, the Sex Pistols uh, and, you know, sort of everything that they, um, you know, the whole genie that they got took out of the bottle in the 1970s. Uh, and, you know, that continued on into bands like the Dead Kennedys uh, from San Francisco that, you know, um, again, took this kind of iconography, these, these images, these symbols, um, juxtaposed, put them together, recombined them in, in ways that, you know, were very like, scandalous um and that were meant to kind of like you know undercut the dominant culture in some ways you can think of punk as like like the whole you know kind of punk style and aesthetics and, and fashion as being influenced by these techniques of kind of cutting things up and 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 using irony and and satire and uh, giving new meanings to um, objects, whether they're, you know, symbolic objects like flags or whether they're just kind of banal commodities like safety pins. But this whole way of like, you know, creating a, a kind of a, a cut and paste aesthetics that tried to kind of turn the dominant culture on its head. Um, later movements, you know, the Billboard Liberation Front uh, came about, you know, I think more in like the 1970s and 80s, um, where they would, you know, again, take uh, billboards and, um, you know, give them different uh, meanings, I suppose you could say it in the most euphemistic kind of way. So like this Wachovia uh, advertisement, you know, is supposed to be it, original ones. The original one says, watch your little ones grow, you know, as if like dollar bills were like your children. And um, so they just changed it to watch your little ones burn and put little flames on top of the $1 bills. 
um, or, you know, American Red Cross, Red Cross, because the government ain't doing squat. Or uh, the one for McDonald's. McDonald's is always like the, the, the choice target <laughs> for, for these kinds of exercises. Um, and then this one, they, they, they took the McDonald's billboard and changed it to, uh, you have ten, about 10,000 taste buds, kill them all. Uh, these are more, you know, kind of recent examples of what came like in the 90s to be known as culture jamming, um, especially associated with the Ad Busters magazine, you know, taking the American flag and replacing the stars with um, corporate logos or taking corporate logos and, you know, turning them around into, uh, I suppose, giving them the the message of what they really mean um, or, uh, you know, this thing with, you know, the iPod, uh, uh, like advertisement, um, making reference to like Abu Ghraib and, and the torture of prisoners like Guantanamo Bay. Um, all pretty like brilliant stuff that, you know, like has really extended these techniques that DeBoard and the Situationists um, had uh, originated. So, you know, like I said, overall, he, in the Society of the Spectacle, DeBoard doesn't really have that much to say about resistance or revolutionary change, but he does end the text in thesis number 221 with a statement that um, again, you know, echoes the thing Marx had said about the, the self-emancipation of the proletariat. Um, in other words, like the working classes couldn't be um, liberated or emancipated by some outside force, you know, by some vanguard party or some group of intellectuals who knew better. They had to uh, emancipate themselves. It was a process in which only the oppressed could truly free themselves. And so here DeBord's, you know, talking about self-emancipation and he says it, it, it can't be achieved by isolated individuals or, or atomized crowds, you know, I suppose not even the most clever act of determinant could, could reverse the society of the spectacle, um, but only uh, by a, the class, which is able to affect the disillusion of all classes. And so this is, you know, kind of, again, referencing a thing Marx had said that, you know, that uh, the revolution against capitalism would be a working class revolution, but it would be a revolution to end classes uh, all for, uh, you know, once and for all. It would be a class war to end the class system, to abolish classes. So um, in May 1968, this came, I guess, as close as you know, De Boer had ever seen towards actually becoming a possibility. Um, in May 1968, French students were protesting as students were all over the world at that point, protesting against American imperialism, protesting against the Vietnam War in particular, but also um, protesting against their own situation in the universities, uh, protesting at large about, you know, capitalism and consumer culture and, you know, all sorts of things. They were seeing that all these issues were fundamentally interconnected. And as, so often happens, as we know, um, at those protests, students were brutalized by the, by the police. And um, as so often happens with police brutality, that didn't squash the protests, it actually made the protests grow much larger. Um, and so French workers began to stage strikes and, and solidarity walkouts and sympathy strikes and, um, you know, what are known as, you know, like wildcat strikes in the sense that they're spontaneous and they're not necessarily like authorized by their union or anything like that. People just like walk off the job and go on strike. 
11 million French workers did this, like nearly a quarter of the national workforce that essentially shut down the economy of France and nearly brought uh, the government to the brink of revolution. So, you know, there was, uh, there was fighting in the streets. There were, you know, as you see here, cars overturned and barricades put up. And, you know, again, nobody knows how to have a revolution like the French. <laughs> like you know, revolutions happen all over the world, but like the French, it's like they're, it's like it's in their cultural DNA or something like that. And, and of course, in this French kind of way, um, it was not just a revolution, but like, you know, there was, you know, poetry and, you know, like graffiti and it was all a very kind of artistic as well as political um, occurrence uh, movement happening. Uh, and so all over the streets of Paris, you know, they're spray painting things like, you know, it is forbidden to forbid and power to the imagination and poetry is in the streets. You know, it's not just like, fuck the police. It's like, you know, there's, there's this kind of uh, artistic cultural sense in which people need to not just change the structures of the political and economic system, they also need to change life. They need to ch change the way that life is lived because uh, life has been colonized by the commodity and the spectacle and because all aspects of our uh, everyday life are now alienated, that means that a revolution must be not just a change in the fundamental political and economic social structure, it must be a change in culture, a change in life. Um, I do want to end this um, with a bit of my own criticism um, and kind of, you know, like take it or, or, or leave it. Uh, for Marx, the difference between Debord and Marx kind of is like, you know, that for, for Marx, the, the commodity embodies or inhabits this, this fundamental contradiction between use value and exchange value. You know, at the, at the core existence of the commodity, there is this built-in fundamental contradiction of, of like, you know, profit for use versus um, or, uh, production for use versus production for profit. Okay. Um, Debord does not see a similar kind of contradiction in the spectacle. Um, he does not consider basically the use value of the spectacle in people's lives. Like, why are we drawn to them? What needs do these spectacles fulfill in our lives? You know, Marx says that every commodity must to some extent meet a human need. Um, otherwise it is worthless. Those needs might be totally bizarre and perverse and you know manufactured, um, but they are a need nonetheless. And so the board you know, doesn't really kind of pursue this question of like the use value of the spectacle. When Marx had been talking about religion, he, he had compared it, you know, with opium, like we said earlier in an earlier slide. But, but he also said, you know, that religion was the sigh of the oppressed creature, the heart of a heartless world, and the soul of soulless conditions. So, you know, he was like, you know, kind of like arguing with like the atheists of his time, like the atheist philosophers of his time and, and saying that, you know, the goal is not to just like abolish religion. Um, the goal is really to abolish the oppressive social conditions that cause people to turn to religion in the first place. It, um, that, you know, yeah, religion is, is an illusion and it's something that, you know, represents this kind of like this fundamental inversion of, of a world turned upside down and it's, 
you know, all kinds of, you know, ways in which we enslave ourselves to something that's actually socially constructed. Um, but we need to kind of go deeper, he was, he was saying to these, you know, atheists of, of his time, to some of the young Hegelians. And so he continues on in this famous passage and says, you know, thus, criticism has plucked the imaginary flowers on the chain, not in order that man shall continue to bear that chain without fantasy or consolation, but so that he shall throw off the chain and pluck the living flower. In other words, like what we have to do as critics, you know, you know, what the point of criticism is to do is not just to like take people's religion away from them so that now they have to like live in this like heartless, soulless world without any consolation, without any like, you know, uh, a sense of like, you know, something higher or a better afterlife or something like that, you know, we don't want to do that so that people have to, you know, just suffer on the, on the chain. Uh, what we ultimately want to do is help people to throw off the chains, to, to self-emancipate themselves from those chains and then pluck the living flower in the sense of like what it was that, you know, religion, you know, in all its kind of perverse inverted forms was trying to do, you know, to try to, you know, ideas of like brotherly and sisterly love or, you know, um, you know, a, a, a sense of connection with nature. So, you know, the living flower uh, is the thing that really Debord does not or cannot find within the spectacle. Uh, he cannot find, you know, what Marx had seen as like the seeds or the, the kernels of potential liberation, even in the most oppressive social forms or, you know, within the commodity, Marx could always find um, some kind of kernel of potential liberation because that's what, you know, the dialectical method is all about. So instead, you know, kind of like Adorno, what uh, Debord does is, is he, he, you know, writes about people in in this pretty kind of condescending tone, um, you know, that basically people are kind of like easily, you know, pacified and, and manipulated as, as consumers and spectators. Um, so I think that that's a real, you know, kind of uh, uh, limitation on the, the political, the, his politics and the political efficacy of, of this idea of the society of the spectacle. Anyway, I hope that that, um, you know, take that criticism or, or leave it, but I hope that this has been helpful for you to, to understanding the, the text itself and sort of the, the context surrounding it. Until next time, I'll see you later.